Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Ward, uh, Pastor Ward, if you want to call me that, or you can call me Brother Ward. And um, let's pray real quick. Father God, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for the cross. Uh, thank you for the intercession you're making for us in the most holy place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I'm just coming to you um, online right now, and, and I just want to talk to you, just man to man, Christian to Christian, person to person. We know we're living in uh, some troublous times. You know, the, uh, the entire world is on lockdown. And I just want to talk to you from my heart. Is that all right? Okay, let's go. But before I get into what I feel like the Lord has impressed me, I want to put a disclaimer out there. Um, I believe that we should be aware of the signs. Uh, you know, the Bible You know, the Bible says, you know, that, that we should study prophecy. I believe that. I believe that we should be aware of the signs. And because I know when you preach sermons like this, someone automatically gets up in their head, oh, my, oh, he doesn't believe in, he doesn't believe in look, looking for the signs. Yes, I do. So I just want you to see that, you know, we live in a church uh, that's divided. You know, the devil wants us to be divided. You have liberals, you have conservatives, you have present truth. Everyone has their own theological circle, and they only go to teachers who preach whoever favors their theology. And as soon as they hear someone that they feel like doesn't favor their theology, they automatically just lock their brain down. That's not intelligent. So at least listen to everything I have to say before you make a judgment. Uh, you know, my, my question is, are the children of the world more intelligent than the children of light? Uh, there's this YouTube page called TED Talks, and it's just full of people who give it, you know, uh, advice and things that they've done in life. And there was this one TED Talk called, Why I, as a black man, attended KKK rallies. And so I had to look at that because I was like, I want to know that because I'm a black man, or at least I'm half black. And, and the brother was talking about how when he was young, you know, and he, he joined the Boy Scouts, how he went, you know, he, the first time they went into the community, stuff was getting thrown out. And, the, and, and, and all of his uh, Boy Scout leaders had to shield him. And he said he went home and talked to his parents and said, why were they doing this to me? And he said his parents told him they're doing this because of racism. And he said, I didn't believe my parents. And he said, all my life, I could never understand racism. So he, he became a real successful musician. This is, CNN actually ended up uh, doing a story on this. But the point is, he wanted to understand his enemy so bad, not because he agreed with them, he just wanted to see the way they think, that he started interviewing with a grand wizard of the KKK. And to make a long story short, they developed a great friendship. He would go to the KKK rallies, not because he agreed with them, just to understand him. And the KKK rallies would come, and, and the grand wizard would come to hear him, hear him play his music. Long story short, that grand wizard ended up leaving the KKK and denounced it. And, the, it's, and it was by Daryl Davis. It's called, Why is a Black Man? I attended KKK rallies by Daryl Davis. And he said at the end, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a sociologist, but he said something powerful that's going to stick with me. He said, when enemies listen to each other, it doesn't leave time for fighting because they're talking. So because he listened to his enemy, his enemy ended up changing his mind. So let's listen, amen? Let's pray one more time before we get into the word. Father God, I just pray that you continue to be with us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, it's interesting. Everybody's sending me messages, you know, since this corona thing happened. You know, everyone, everyone is doing their own sermon on YouTube, putting their little talks up. You know, people are saying we need to spend more time with family. We need to do this, we need to do that. And Advent and some of my friends are sending me things and they'll say things like, Josh, look at this video. Uh, it's two hours worth of the corona, how America is taking, how America is using the corona to take away our, our rights. And I don't disagree with that. Revelation chapter 13 says that uh, America is the uh, uh, lamb-like beast. But they're sending me all these things. They'll say things like, stuff I've been hearing my whole entire life is coming to fruition. I want to get serious about God now. Uh, or, or, or things like, I hear people say, you know, this showed me that if the market of beasts passed right now, me and my family wouldn't be ready because I can't feed myself. And, and I don't disagree with that. Even me and my wife through this, have, God has shown us that we need to learn how to garden. You know, we're, we're starting to do that. So I don't disagree with that, that we do need to get serious about God. And, and I think God is using this coronavirus as a sign. But the question I want to ask is, what is your motivation behind that? And, and that's what I've titled our short message tonight is true motivation. I don't disagree that God is using these things, these signs, this corona to arouse us and that we do need to get out into the country. We do need to learn how to grow our own food because there's going to come a time when we can't buy ourselves. But what is your motivation behind that? 
And that's my question, and that's what I want us to wrap up in our minds as we study this evening. And while everyone was expressing what God has impressed them to do during this uh, 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 quarantine, what God has impressed me to do, me and my wife, is to examine ourselves. And, and to really see, you know, he's, he's saying, Josh, examine yourself. Do you really love me? What is your motivation for serving me? And you see this. The Apostle Paul said the same thing himself. So let's look in the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 15, chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Look what it says. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? So God is calling us to examine ourselves. That's the main reason why I feel like he allowed this coronavirus to be passed because he's given us time to sit alone in our houses and really understand are we, what is our motivations behind serving him. Now, some of us are just using this time to watch more movies and watch more TV. If you want to waste your time, that's fine. But God has moved upon my heart to really examine myself and my wife, and I want to share that with you. And while I was contemplating this message, what, what I was going to share, and, and, and God, I felt, impressed me. I'm not saying this is gospel, but he impressed me that there's three ways that people are reacting to this coronavirus. There's three motivations that they have, and only one is correct. And the three motivations, I'm going to give them to you now, and we're going to walk through them, are fear, love, which is the correct one, or enthusiasm, but doesn't have the love of God in it. Diluted enthusiasm. Diluted enthusiasm. And we'll see that. So let's go to uh, point one. And that's the fact that Serving God out of fear doesn't last. It's not a great motivator because as soon as the fear leaves, you're going to go right back to doing what you were doing. And you'll see this in the Bible and in the Spirit of Prophecy. Let me read this quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 97, paragraph 3. This is talking about Noah. We know the story of Noah, the antediluvian world before the flood. You know, he had been preaching for 125 years that there's a flood coming. No one believed him. They called him a fanatic. They said, you're crazy. Rain had never came up on the earth because according to the book of Genesis, the earth was watered through the bottom of the ground. But look what the pen of inspiration says. Talking about the antediluvian world. It says, uh, the period of their probation was about to expire. Noah had faithfully followed the instructions which he had received from God. The ark was finished in every part as the Lord had directed and was stored with food for man and beast. And now the servant of God made his last solemn appeal to the people. With agony of desire that words cannot express, he entreated them to seek a refuge that it might be found. He was pleading with them, please, please listen to the word of God and get on the ark. And it says, again, they rejected his words and raised their voices in jest and scoffing. But watch. It says, suddenly a silence fell upon the mocking throng. Beasts of every description, the fiercest as well as the most gentle, were seen coming from mountain and forest and quietly making their way toward the ark. A noise as of a rushing wind was heard, and lo, birds were flocking from all directions, their numbers darkening the heavens, and in perfect order they passed to the ark. So in other words, these same people were calling uh, Noah a fanatic, crazy, because they saw a sign. They literally saw every, this is deep to me, they saw every animal walking. So that made them get quiet. They was like, whoa. They stopped laughing. But watch. Watch what it says. It says, the world looked in wonder, some in fear. Fear is not the motivator, my brothers and sisters. What's your true motivation? It says, philosophers were called upon to account for the singular occurrence, but in vain. It was a mystery which they could not fathom. But man, watch this, but man had become so hardened by their persistent rejection of light that even this scene produced but a, manda, but, but a momentary impression. As the doomed race beheld the sun shining in its glory and the earth clad in utmost Eden beauty, they banished their rising fears by boisterous merriment. So in other words, as soon as the, it, it, when they saw the animals going into the ark, they was like, oh God, I need to get serious. That, that looks serious. 
Now we see the Quran, I want to get serious about God. But as soon as the animals went into the ark, the impression left them because they were so used to rejecting light. So the point is that fear is not going to hold you. Because as soon as this little corona passes, I mean, it, it could be like some people are preaching that this is going to completely uh, uh, usher in the mark of the beast and it's all over. That could be true. I'm not doubting that. But if it doesn't, I believe God is using this the same way he used the animals going into the ark to give like one to, to, to give like one of his final cries before the close of probation to wake his people up. But because they had been rejecting light so much, as soon as they saw the animals go into the ark, they went right back to what they were doing. That's amazing to me. Think about that. Just think. If you saw every single animal, one by one, walk into an ark that a man was preaching that was being built by God because a flood is coming, and, and as soon as they go in, you go right about your business. That's why it has to be more than fear. We need a supernatural power. And, you, and someone says, well, that's the pen of inspiration. Show me an example from the Bible. I'll show you an example from the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. See, signs are not going to do it, brothers and sisters. Yes, we should be aware of the signs, but that's not going to change us. The Bible says there's only one man that can change us, and that's the man Christ Jesus. Genesis chapter 4, verse 13. Look what it says. The Bible is amazing when I read it, man. It amazes me. Genesis chapter 4, verse 13. Look what it said. This is talking about Cain after he killed Abel. Genesis chapter 4, verse 13. Look what it says. After Cain killed Abel. Understand now, this is Cain talking to God the Father. It's not like today. This was right in the beginning. You know, God's never talked to me in an audible voice. I'm not saying he can't do that to people, but he's never done that to me. But this was Cain talking to God audibly. Look what he says. He says, Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 13, uh, this is Cain. He says, and the Lord, and Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. So in other words, he's saying, because I was the first murderer, if anyone sees me, they're going to take vengeance on me. So I'm scared, God. I'm scared I'm going to die. Help me. Do something. Save me. And God is so gracious. He does. He saves Cain. He saves Cain who just killed his brother. God says, I'm going to put a mark on you so they'll know not to touch you. Look at the grace of God. As soon as Cain gets what he wants and his fear is gone, watch what he does. Verse 15. No, no. Verse 16. Uh-uh. Then Cain went from the presence of the Lord. So as soon as he got what he wanted, as soon as he knew he wasn't going to die anymore, as soon as he knew the fear was gone, he left the presence of God. It says, then Cain went from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Verse 17. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch and built a city. And that's for all you people who still want to live in cities. Cities was invented by Cain. It's amazing to me. Fear is not going to do it, brothers and sisters. Brings me to my next point. So if one reaction is fear, another reaction is deluded fanaticism. And I have to receive this one. I was in this one. I can take my own, my own word. See, a lot of us, you know, people, you know, they see the preacher, they see me. They see the suit and, you know, I'm preaching with passion. This is for me. God is trying to save me. He's telling me, Josh, examine yourself. What's really in your heart? So deluded fanaticism. And you see this in the church. You have many independent ministries. And I'm not against independent ministries. God is going to use independent ministries. He is using independent ministries. Amazing Facts is an independent ministry. Powerful ministry for God. Uh, uh, uh. 3 ABN, independent ministry, powerful ministry from God. But I'm saying there's some attitude of some of the brethren within the church. They have the attitude of oh, all the other Adventists of faith. They're not spiritual. But we, the independent ministry, we're going to finish the work. We're going to receive the seal of God. Deluded fanaticism. You don't, we don't know our hearts. And you see the same thing in the Bible. Look at the disciples. Watch. John chapter 13, verse 36 through 38. Look what Peter says to Jesus. He was a deluded fanatic at that point. Look, 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 look what Jesus says to Peter. John 13, verse 36. 
John chapter 13. This was uh, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. You know, he's near the end of his ministry. He's trying to give his disciples, really show them what it means to be a Christian leader. They didn't get it. John chapter 13, verse 36. Watch what Peter says. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered and said, where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but you shall follow me afterwards. So in other words, you want to go to heaven, but you ain't ready. <laughs> you ain't ready to go to heaven. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. So in other words, uh, Peter was like, you know, I'll lay down my life for you. These other disciples, you know, these other disciples, you know, they, they fake. They, they, they're not as serious as I am. And Peter, you know, I'm most like him. He was the one of the disciples always ready to run his mouth. He pretty much said the other disciples, they're not, they're not as hard as me. They're not as committed to you as me. He was a deluded fanatic. Look what Jesus said. Oh, Jesus said, oh, will you lay down your life for my sake? He asked him a question. Oh, really, Peter? You're going to lay down your life for me? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. And you see it with the other disciples. Uh, you see it in uh, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 54. Luke chapter 9, verse 54. You don't have to turn there. As a matter of fact, go ahead and turn there. Luke, Luke chapter 9. I want you to see this because I want you to see that See, because we like to deceive ourselves as Christians, man. You know, Christians, we play games. We play games with God. So what we do, we come to the church, and whatever we don't want to do with our life, we try to make those decisions and put God on it. So if we're lazy and we don't want to go through the school, we'll say, well, our schools are not following the blueprint. Boom, so I'm going to drop out and go do this. But years later, you ain't doing what God told you to do. You see, we, we like to play games with God, things like that. Luke chapter 9, verse 54. Look. Look at the disciples. Luke chapter 9, verse 54. Watch what they said. This is uh, James and John. This is why Jesus called them the sons of thunder. He says, and when the disciples, James and John, saw this, you know, somebody denied Jesus. He, he, he went, Jesus, they went to a city. Jesus was preaching to them. They didn't want to receive the message. So this is how his disciples responded. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? So in other words, just like some of the brethren today think they're the only ones that's going to receive the seal of God, the only ones going to receive the latter rain, and everyone that's in the conference or, or going to church is just is, 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 is not a true Adventist or not giving all their heart. We're the only ones going to receive it. So in other words, they're, they're like, man, rain down fire on them, God. They're not spiritual. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said, uh, 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 but then he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy man's life, but to save them. But to save them. His own disciples. See, they all fell into all three of these categories. It wasn't until after the cross that they really understood. And that's the type of experience I want. I was the same way. I came in. The, I have to talk about myself because I, I preach everyone else, but after they receive myself too, because I didn't grow up in this thing. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't. Let alone the Adventist church. I didn't grow up in church at all. I come from a hood family. To this day, my family are not Christians. But God's grace, I'm going to save them. The Lord is working on them. I'm giving Bible studies to my brother. My mother, I've been praying with her and talking with her. God is going to save them. He showed me that when I first came in. But the point is, I was smoking weed at the age of six. Out to, out to five o'clock in the morning at the age of six. See, see, I love to fight. So, Because the brothers at the age of six, they would start fights and have me fighting. So when I came into church, I tried to bring that same spirit, just like the sons of thunder. Right, run, right, uh, rain fire down up on Thinking I'm so spiritual. I came to Oakwood, you know, because in my mind, when I came to Oakwood, I thought it was going to be all spiritual. I mean, it's God's school. He's there. But it wasn't what I thought it was. So I was like, man, I'm all these little weak Adventists. I was the same, same thing Peter told Jesus. All these little weak Adventists. I would never deny you like that. But God showed me. It's not the right spirit, my son. You're a deluded fanatic. You don't really know yourself. Look at this quote. From Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was a, a very good man of God, theologian, during Nazi Germany. Actually gave his life, uh, was killed by the Germans. Look what he says. It says, in, 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 in referral to disciples who are overzealous and are trying to force people to receive the truth, like the disciples were. It says, the driving restlessness of the group of disciples who do not want to accept any limitation, any limitation on their effectiveness and zeal, which does not respect resistance, confuses the word of the gospel, 
with a conquering idea. An idea requires fanatics who neither know nor respect resistance. The idea is strong, but the word of God is so weak that it suffers to be despised and rejected by people. See, God does not conquer the way the world does. He came in down on the cross. He doesn't force you to accept him. And I had to learn that the hard way. I'm still learning because I'm so passionate because what I've been through. You know, I didn't grow up in this thing. This thing was sweet to me. We got the truth, brothers and sisters. And I say that with no apologetic. God has people in every church, but this is God's women church of Bible prophecy. And because I like to fight, like when I was in the group home, the, before I ever thought about becoming a Christian, the first book of the Bible I ever read was Revelation because I like action. God has to break that because that's not, his, that's not his principle. Paul says in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that it's the love of God that, re, that leads us to repentance. Not, 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 the, not the conquering of God, not the harshness of God, not the forcedness of God. It's the love of God that leads us to repentance. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. That's how you win people. The disciples didn't understand it. And there's some brothers that they don't understand it. See, Adventists, woo, we think we're so spiritual because you know, because we got the truth. We, we, we're so full of it. And we think we're so spiritual. Deluded fanaticism. Don't get mad at me. I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm showing you a Bible and I'm showing you a spirit of prophecy. Look at this quote. I showed you from the Bible. Look at this quote from Testimonies, Volume 5, 168, Paragraph 2. And this is what the Lord is teaching me. It says, no matter how high his profession, he whose heart is not imbued with love for God and for his fellow man is not a disciple of Christ. Though he should possess great faith and even have power to work miracles, yet without love, his faith would be worthless he might display great liberality, but should he from some other motive than genuine love bestow all his goods to feed the poor, the act would not commend him to the favor of God. Watch this. In his zeal, he might even meet a martyr's death. Yet if destitute of the gold of the love, he would be regarded by God as a deluded enthusiast or an ambitious hypocrite. And that goes right with Corinthians 13. So you can, according to this, you can die for God and be lost. That is amazing to me. Because some people naturally are fearful. They don't like the straight truth. So they try to do away with the word. But some people like myself just have soldier mentality. Like when I was 18, I tried to go to the Navy SEAL. The Lord shut it down. Some people just like to fight. And they bring that spirit into the church and they think because they're so who, who with the word, that that's the spirit of God. But you can have all that zeal for the truth which is true, and still be lost because you don't have love. And that's the true motivation. So that's why my question was, what's your motivation? Is it because you're scared because you see the signs? Now you want to get serious about God? Now you want to study Bible prophecy? Now you want to go live in the country? Or are you one of those ones who are deluded fanatic, who think you're better than everyone in the church and you're preaching so hard and you think you got it all together? You can have all that zeal for the truth, but if you have no love, going to be lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I know this is a hard word, but this is what we need, brothers and sisters. I want to be saved. And I'm preaching to myself. If, if no one listens to this, I'll receive this word for myself. Like Noah. The Bible says the only person that was saved in his ministry was him and his family. So if that means if the rest of my ministry, if I never get picked up, I want to get picked up. If, if, I, if I never succeed any so-called success in this world as a minister, if me and my wife are saved, I'll be satisfied with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Watch what the Apostle Paul said. This is some serious stuff, brothers and sisters. It says, though I speak with the tongues of man, and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits nothing. He said, though I give my body to be burned, that's deep. You can burn for Jesus. And, and the reason why this message hits me so hard, because I never met my father, don't even know his name. So I grew up with a level of anger. 
and I, and I wanted to bring it into my ministry. It does not work. It doesn't win people. I may win the argument, and I'm right. I may be right in my theology, but they're not saved. We have to allow the Lord to really break us with his love. That's what's going to prepare us for the soul of God. That's what's going to keep us from the... Because if it's fear, when the mark of the beast comes, psh, fear ain't going to hold you. I have a wife. What if the salmon kills your wife? Fear ain't going to do it. The only way I can stand for something like that, if, if, if Christ is formed in me, the hope of glory, 1 Col Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, it's the love of Jesus. And I'm not talking about to, to this postmodern millennial understanding of love or anything goes, this, 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 this sick sentimentalism. I'm talking about the principle of God. God's love is so powerful, it can eradicate all sin from your life. That's what he's shown the devil in the great controversy. He's shown him, my love is so powerful that it can take sin away. So it's not going to be those who get victory over sin and receive the seal of God. It's not going to be because they're trying so hard. And, uh, it's going to be because they've been so filled with the love of Jesus that they can't sin because they're just so full of Jesus. This brings me to my final point. So you're like, I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but I want you to understand something. So even and this is this is why I serve God right here. This is why I love Jesus. Even if you came to him because of fear, even if you came to him as a deluded fanatic, he will still use that to bring you into relationship with himself. Like the disciples, they thought Jesus was coming to reestablish the, uh, 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 the, the, the Jewish monarchy like it was under King David. That's why when, 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 when Jesus told Peter, I got to go to the cross, Peter was like, uh uh, come here, you ain't going to the cross, he rebuked Jesus. But even though they came with their own selfish motivations, he still worked with them and developed a relationship with them. So yes, you may be responding to this virus out of fear. You may be a deluded fanatic. But God will use that if you're willing to develop a relationship. That's why Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says that he will finish the work that he started in you. And Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says that he gives us the power to will and to do. I remember when I first came to God. Honestly, it wasn't because I was so in love with Jesus. I was just tired of being a loser. I was tired of being locked up. I was tired of not having anything in life. And I just wanted something better out of life. I didn't understand that I was going to have to be a disciple and pick up the cross. But he, he worked with me where I was at and he wooed me. It's almost like marriage. You know, the honeymoon, everything's going all good. After the honeymoon is over and you, you've been with your spouse for, for a while and you realize that now it's not about sex or it's, or, or it's not about what you want out of the person, but it's about you loving that person for who that person is with all their flaws. It's the same way with Jesus. He woos you, but then he brings you into discipleship. So I just, I want us to get this, brothers and sisters, because because it scares me a little bit. I see Adventists, oh, the corona, like, like well, there's like two-hour videos on the corona. I understand that, but instead of spending two hours looking at the corona, why don't you spend two hours reading this Bible? The, the, the Bible says in Hebrews 12 that, that, that it, we should keep looking. Hebrews 12. Let me read the text. Hebrews 12, chapter 2. This is going to be the last text I'm going to read. Hebrews chapter 12, too. Hebrews chapter 12. See, what we don't understand, man, is that the devil will use anything to take the place of Jesus, even good things. He just wants to keep us from having Jesus because he knows without Jesus, we're helpless. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 2, watch what it says. It says, looking unto Jesus. Notice it doesn't say looking unto the coronavirus. Looking unto Jesus. And when you look at that up in the Greek, it means continuously looking. In some, in some translations say, keep looking. Keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So my Bible instructs me to keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. So that is my prayer for all of us, everyone in the world, not just people in the seven-day Adventist church, everyone alive. We need to look to Jesus. The Bible says, by beholding you become changed. I mean, I'm a living testimony that I didn't grow up in this thing, not a Christian home, but I started seeking Jesus and he started to naturally change me. And that's my prayer for us. Let's pray. Father God, Help us, Lord. Man, we're, we're lost. Lord, we're in a lost condition. We don't understand it. 
You said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, that we're little to see, oh, Father, that we think we're rich and increased, we're good, but you're knocking on the door. You're knocking. You're not even in our hearts. Help us, Lord. You're not even in the church. Help us, Lord, to look unto you, the author and finisher of our faith, to be filled with you so that we can stand for you in these last days of earth's history. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.